Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's SmartCap webinar, where we're looking at a case study uh, based here in Australia, where a mining company was comparing some fatigue technologies. Uh, this is a particularly interesting case for a few reasons, and so I'm hopeful it's going to be an interesting webinar for everyone. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping first, as we always do. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, uh, both the audio and the video, and so please keep in mind um, that you don't need to frantically write down notes. Everything you're hearing and seeing today is going to be posted on our various social media channels. So sit back, relax, and start formulating those questions. Um, but by recording, what that also means is uh, if you do ask a question uh, audibly, that's going to also be recorded. So please keep that in mind. Uh, so without further ado, let's kick things off. Um, and as always, I'd like to set the scene by giving a bit of the backstory to, to this particular case study. And so the, this was a coal mine or a coal mining operation, an open cut coal mine in Queensland, Australia. And um, that's particularly uh, interesting for a bullet point that's coming up soon. Um, we've done a lot of work with coal mines around the world, but limited work with coal mining in Queensland, which is our home state in our home country. This particular mine site engaged us. Uh, and when we asked the question, why is it that you're interested in talking to businesses like SmartCap? Um, it wasn't because that had some sort of major catastrophe, fatigue related incident uh, in the recent past. They were more along the lines of looking to proactively get ahead of what was a clear perceived risk based on some, some sort of minor reportable incidents in the past. Um, one thing that's particularly critical though, is because this is a coal mine in Queensland, there are legislative requirements and that made this much more complicated than really any deployment we've done. Um, the legislation for Queensland coal mines is that, and not being a lawyer, is that any change to the way the employer or the coal mine assesses people's fitness for work requires a majority support of the workforce. And this is in the form of a ballot. Um, this majority workforce support um, has to cover all coal mine workers. And so that even includes the coal mine workers who'll have no interaction with the new policies that are being put in, putting in place. Um, additional context is that other coal mines in the region from different companies um, had tried to adopt fatigue technologies in the past and had gone through this ballot process unsuccessfully. And what that means is that gone and tested whatever they were testing and they're uh, looking to implement a solution. And when they put the proposed changes to the procedures up for a vote, the workforce effectively voted it down. And by voting it down, that means all of those efforts go out the window and they can't implement the technology because they can't adopt the processes that are needed to make it a success. Uh, when engaging with this, and I was personally involved, so that's why I'm particularly um, interested in this case study, um, the initial meeting on site uh, was promising, and promising not, uh, not really from a sales perspective, promising uh, from a success perspective because everyone who was going to interact with the system had representation in the room. So this is from the site senior executive, uh, superintendent, supervisor level, technology people, commercial people, as well as uh, coal mine workers, equipment operators were there. And so by having this full range, all of the different types of questions came out uh, and everyone else got exposed to all of those different concerns and preferences and so forth. So it was a really good engaging first meeting, but one of the things that became clear uh, within that meeting is that uh, as we would expect, they're looking at other technology providers in the fatigue space um, and a decision had already been made that they were going to pick two, their two preferred technologies and really have a shootout and see which one succeeded. Um, so this backstory alone, being a coal mine in Queensland and being a technology shootout is already fairly interesting and a couple more things including COVID made it uh, further interesting. What I want to do is kind of give uh, the spoiler alert, the, the punchline first, and then step through the details of it. And so really, as a, as a single slide of how this all played out, um, what was decided was a three-month or 90-day shootout um, where the clear message to the workforce from senior management was, we will pick one. 
In other words, do nothing is no longer an option here. That kind of sets a very different tone to the typical trial where we're looking at a particular technology and if we're happy, we might do something with it. By making it clear that one technology will be chosen, uh, it changes the tone for the workforce. We're no longer in a position where we can push back and say, we don't want anything. We're now really forced to differentiate these two solutions that we're looking at. Uh, the scale of this particular three-month pilot was 32 equipment operators spread across uh, eight trucks. And so four trucks were implemented uh, with our solution. Four trucks were, were, had a camera solution, one of our competitor technologies installed. And these 32 operators were going to cycle across uh, the different pieces of equipment. So they'd spend half their time with one and then swap over to the other solution. Uh, the steps of installation, commissioning, on-site training and go-live happen in that order and it all went fairly smoothly, um, fairly much to plan uh, and the go-live happened the day of training. So they had four, four work crews and they found that sort of beautiful intersection point within the roster where in the space of two days we could get across all of the four crews and so within that space of two days, all crews were trained up and, and the system was live. Because a camera solution was employed as sort of the other option for this business, um, camera technologies tend to use this first month as a, as a baseline period to sort of uh, whatever it is that they do with assessing sort of this one month baseline before they implement alarms. And so, to keep things a bit fairer, they tended to do that with us too. Um, and so that was implemented where the first month was only feedback to the individuals in the cab, but nothing was getting escalated through to management. Um, that's a little bit different to our normal approach because we think early warning alerts should be delivered um, as soon as they're made available. And fatigue alarms, when risk is genuinely identified, it should be escalated immediately so a business can intervene to keep their people safe. But fair is fair, and so in a shootout, sometimes we have to make that compromise. Once things were underway, we followed our normal process, which was feedback and engagement sessions with the participating operators. And so this is sort of the warts and all, ask any questions you'd like to ask um, and give us any feedback that you'd like us to respond to, which brings me to a point that I haven't raised um, on this live webinar uh, for all the attendees, uh, you should see in your webinar box, and I'm just looking at my screen now, um, you have the option to raise your hand if you'd like to uh, me to stop and answer any questions you have. But in addition, you can post your questions to the chat or the questions log, uh, and I'll see if I can get to them as soon as they're posted. If not, I'll see if I can roll them in at the end. I'm sorry, I missed that. So back to, back to the story. Uh, the the questions, the engagement sessions were run and this was run at two different stages and as per normal this was run at about the three week point from go live which is enough time for everyone to have gone through one full roster swing uh, of using our solution and that's when the real questions come up. Throughout this three months one of the things we typically do and certainly at this particular case as well is we look to identify the wish list, which is are there, are there things from our solution you were hoping to have seen, but you haven't yet seen? And more importantly, now that you've had some exposure to it, are there things that you wish were in there, things you wish it did or features you wish were included um, that aren't yet? And so this is where we can look to keep as an agile business, even though we have a global footprint, to kind of keep meeting the needs of our customers. This was, Run and I'm going to touch on this a little bit later. Um, and as per normal, as things started wrapping up, we share from our perspective what the data is telling us, what insights we think the business can draw from that so that they can draw their conclusions. But because this was a Queensland coal mining site where a workforce ballot's required, uh, this is where really it's up to the workforce. And this business took an approach where they said to the workforce, number one, we're going to vote on which one you want. So you tell us which solution you want. And then number two, once you've told us that, we'll go draft up some policies and procedures more linked to that technology solution. And then you're gonna be asked to vote on the procedural change as is the requirement under legislation. 
And so um, that's the ballot. When the workforce gave their feedback and selected a technology, I'm proud to say SmartCap was selected. Uh, we received 90% of the vote and our competitor received 10%. We're gonna to touch on a little bit why we think that might be the case. Uh, and because we were selected, they, they voted on a ballot of procedures and policies more focused on our solution, which is an early warning alert, identifying when risk exists rather than detecting when sleep's already occurred. And then the deployment. And so today they're an existing customer with a full rollout and we're gonna to touch on some of the things that we've learned since then. But all of this has played out within the last 12 months. So the pilot that we're talking about launched in around September last year, so 13 months ago, uh, through to being a fully deployed customer today. The bits that I've highlighted, if you can see on your screen in yellow, are the bits I wanna sort of dive in a little bit deeper on as we walk through how this case study played out. I wanna start with this shootout approach. And uh, this is something we've seen quite regularly where people wanna compare one technology and another and they kinda of wanna do it all at the same time. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, but there are some benefits and there are some limitations to this approach. One of the benefits of uh, having two technologies run in parallel in the fatigue space on a site is that you don't run into as much of what I call the first impressions problem, which is, Fatigue technology isn't new, but it's generally new to each site doing a shootout. And so the first impression problem is that the first touch and feel of any fatigue technology, these advanced capabilities, uh, usually is the one that resonates the most. It's the first time anyone's had to consider or heard that type of messaging. And so when you're doing two at the same time, both solution providers can make their first impression at the same time. So you don't end up having that bias there, which is a definite benefit. Um, certainly if in cases where we've gone first and then our competitor has gone second, uh, what we've seen is that our messaging has kind of held true as that first impression of truth. Whereas when our competitor has gone first, we've had to, I guess, try to undo any of the misconceptions that might, might be there. The other benefit of having this done in parallel is you don't have the I can't remember problem. Um, since to have any reasonable exposure to a technology, we're talking about 60 days or 90 days of real use. Um, and so if you go through three months of using one solution and then you pull the equipment out and you put in the second solution, what tends to happen is when you ask now what is six months after we began this process at a minimum, you say, well, what did you think of the first solution? And the response is, well, I can't really remember. I've been using this one for the last three months and I'm, I've become okay with it. And so the shootout approach being simultaneous overcomes these sorts of problems. And what you end up doing, of course, as a business is it's a faster path to picking something and deploying it. If what your ultimate goal is, is to find a technology that's suitable and get it out there into your fleet. Um, those are what I think are the key benefits, but the limitations I think are worth pondering um, the first one is a mixed message. Um, even if a business has done its homework um, and found which technology it thinks is right for, for it, um, this will certainly be the first message to the workforce is to say, hey, we're thinking about fatigue and improving how we manage it. And so we're looking at these two technologies. And even if you take what I think is a great posture of we're gonna pick one, uh, as, as was the case in this site, um, you're saying we're gonna pick one, but at the same time saying we've picked two. And so on one hand, the company is sort of saying we've done our homework and these are the top two, but you get to pick which is best, uh, even though we have the duty of care and we probably have a preference. And so it's difficult for a company to have a preference, um, but not impose that preference because then the workforce says, well, you didn't give us any choice in the matter and you just shoved it down our throat. So having that mixed message uh, is a definite difficulty of the shootout, as opposed to pick your favorite, get the messaging right and pilot that. And if for whatever reason there's significant pushback, you can then say, cool, well, we have an option too that you might find more suitable. And then you can come in and, and change that up and be responsive to the workforce. The other thing, and especially when it comes to SmartCap being the world's only early warning alert, uh, technology that goes where you go, whether it's a heavy piece of equipment or a light vehicle or in an office. 
Um, it really is not a fair comparison. Being a fatigue risk detecting technology versus say a camera solution that's detecting when you've already fallen asleep, um, that's not a fair comparison. And so depending on what the level of understanding is of your workforce and what level of understanding you've given them during the rollout, um, it's very difficult for them to say which one is better and which one is worse outside of just personal preferences. What this can also do is by having two things that work quite differently is it can confuse the, pro uh, they, I'm sorry, there can be confusion between the processes associated with it. So for example, when SmartCap delivers an early warning alert, that gentle beep, beep, beep is really just a private message for you to do something simple like sit up straight, sip some water, bite an apple, just self-manage. Um, and in the tiny fraction of the time that you don't or won't successfully self-manage, you might get to a point of risk, a fatigue alarm will go off and generally that's when someone at dispatch would be notified. Now in a case like that, the type of response from dispatch is uh, a welfare check. Nothing's happened yet, just risk has been detected and we're looking to better manage that risk. Whereas if you take, say, a sleep detecting technology, the type of response dispatch might have when someone's confirmed as having fallen asleep in a moving vehicle is quite different to, hey, we've detected some risk and wanna manage it. And so if you're doing two technologies that are really different at the same time, people can get a bit confused about what to do when something beeps. And that confusion can really muddle up one of the benefits of a pilot, of a smaller scale pilot, which is to say how scalable are these processes? Because you have to take a first guess, first guess of how we're gonna to respond to things. And depending on how practical and scalable and the benefits you see, you might wanna make some tweaks before you do a full scale deployment. And assessing that scalability is way more difficult if you've got a bit of confusion between processes because of two, two technologies. Moving on, um, so that's sort of my soliloquy and um, you can uh, hopefully tell I'm pretty passionate about this. I'm looking to have a webinar on kind of this exact topic of um, how you go about selecting a technology and the, what we've seen work and what we've seen not work. And so this is particularly interesting to me. Um, so keep, you, keep an eye on our LinkedIn feed, there'll be a webinar about this soon. Uh, one of the things that I thought's worth highlighting about this particular case study, which is my understanding fed into the decision was how training played out. Um, and so as is for every sort of Gantt chart, um, we have a plan and the plan was to take those uh, eight operators per crew, the 32 operators who are participating in this and, and hold them back after their pre-start meeting for 30 minutes or so for, for a training session. And this training session was going to have everything you normally would want. It's going to have PowerPoint slides, things to touch and feel. Uh, and in addition to that, some support from supervisors. So supervisors there to reinforce the messaging that, look, we're gonna pick one. Supervisors there to make sure that if concerns or questions get a little out of hand, they, they lead um, by their actions and sort of say, hey, let's all be respectful and not talk over each other. All the normal stuff you'd expect, that was the plan. What really happened was, oh yeah, we haven't penciled that in as well as we would have liked. So you guys have five minutes to do this training um, and you don't have PowerPoint. Um, so grab a couple of chairs, wrap them in a circle um, and try to block out the noise from the people around you and get the training done, but you've got five minutes. And so uh, that was interesting. And in addition to this, the supervisor, rather than having the opportunity to be there and lead, lead this sort of process, because we only had five minutes and they were in the middle of doing other things, they could sort of just stand behind the group and listen in. Uh, so it took on a really different dynamic, but one of the, the reason I wanted to point this out was uh, the feedback we received was uh, how impressed the business was that when all of this changed all of a sudden, we've got 30 minutes worth of training and now we've got five minutes to deliver it in, um, how we didn't skip a beat. In five minutes, we hit all the things that we needed to hit and whether it was that shift or 10 shifts later, people were able to use the solution uh, and use it effectively and have a good enough understanding that we could get informed questions uh, come back to us uh, through the normal channels. And so they were impressed that we were able to be agile like that on site because we know what we're doing. 
Um, and so that's a bit of a plug, I guess, for our operations team. Fantastic job. Um, and I think remaining to be agile like this requires yet yeah, a level of expertise that, that we sort of insist on. Um, one of the other things I think that's a bit, of, a bit of a testament is, it's a testament to the solution itself. It's pretty straightforward to use. Um, you wear it, it does the rest and it goes where you go. And so I think that highlighted to the business, hey, this isn't some major involved thing where people need technical descriptions of something. They just, five minutes, they know what they're doing and off they go, self-managing fatigue. So everyone's out there, they're doing their thing, data's being collected and the business is getting an experience with it. And as I touched on, um, one of the things that comes out of that is oh, a wish list, things that they would like to see happen. Um, the uh, reason I wanted to highlight it here is to draw on a particular example. And so the way that this business had implemented it was uh, they were escalating alerts and alarms to dispatch. Uh, and they wanted to do that via two channels simultaneously, by email and by SMS. But because we offer that it's sort of entirely configurable escalation of alerts and alarms, they wanted the SMSs and emails to have different contents based on the level of escalation that was set out in what they call their TARP, their Trigger Action Response Plan. And so when we did that, what they found was because the content of these sort of pre-standardized emails and messages all look kind of the same, is that it was difficult for dispatch to understand what response was really needed. And so they they were hoping at some point in the future we could do something about that and make it clearer what the required response of people was so they didn't have to sort of cast their mind back to the, the details of their training. We responded to this by saying, this is kind of critical if people don't know how to respond to alerts and alarms, all we're doing is when we're, we're not managing the risk as well as we could. So we responded quickly. And so 24 hours after hearing this concern, we had sort of the shiny color PDF uh, proposal back to the business to say, here's what we understand is what you're looking for and here's how we propose to solve that. Um, and if you give us the go ahead, we're gonna go ahead and solve it and do it as quickly as we can. So when we proposed that, within the space of an hour, the mining manager got back to us and gave us the thumbs up and I'm proud to say that our development team within the space of two days had not only developed and fully tested the update, we've, de we've deployed it to their site as a, as a hot live update. And I just wanted to give a bit of a, a snapshot and it might be difficult to see. And so this would be the th examples of the three different escalations they wanted. And so this is using a, a fictional operator, Jane Smith, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so this is where it just was a customized text message showing the particular action that dispatch would take. And similarly, there were differently formatted emails that would highlight to dispatch what action needed to be taken. And the reason I'm bringing this to the attention is we won the shootout, as you know, I gave you the spoiler up front. By when, one of the reasons we were told is why we won is just how responsive we were in meeting their needs and remaining, as I say, an agile, an agile technology business, even though we have a global footprint. When we got toward the end of the pilot, as we always do, we, we start sharing what the data is telling uh, from a bigger picture and not just uh, alerts and alarms in real time, which is, I guess, the primary purpose of the solution. And one of the things that this the data was telling us was, uh, as kind of expected everywhere, there was significantly higher fatigue risk during night shift. Um, but what was starting to emerge is if you can see just near the moon picture on the left here, this sort of dip in fatigue risk between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. And this was coming about, um, it was hypothesized because that's around when the second crib break or the rest break uh, during night shift was occurring. And it turns out that that rest break is generally across those 32 individuals having a benefit. Uh, we saw similar patterns, but a bit more pronounced that almost all of their fatigue risk alarms were happening on night shift. One of the other things that I guess stood out, even though we're only talking about a small amount of data at this point in time, was uh, we found that through just the way the system works, the willingness and engagement of the operators, and I guess in part from the training that they'd received, uh, the operators 
were 94.6% effective in responding to the early warning alerts. So what that means is less than 5% of the time they got to an early warning alert, they were unable to prevent progressing to a point of a fatigue risk alarm. And so that's good. We're able to demonstrate that their workforce is effectively self-managing. And one of the other things we showed, it's not shown here, is that that effectiveness was improving over time. And as we've said in earlier webinars, that's because people genuinely do learn what works for them because they're receiving real-time feedback. And the other things we found, again, what we, what we always find is that a small number of individual individuals uh, represent the overwhelming majority of the fatigue risk within an organization. And so in this case, three operators out of 32 represented just shy of 88% of all fatigue alarms that were triggered. And so these are the individuals that will benefit the most from some help to, I guess, find out what the underlying cause is of that elevated fatigue risk or routine fatigue risk uh, and see if it's something that can be remedied. Um, and each of these two boxes, firstly, how people can self-manage and do well, what we've learned from that. And secondly, um, how to assist higher alarm rate individuals. Both of those things are topic of two separate previous SmartCap webinars and the recordings are already posted online. So jump on our LinkedIn feed, uh, go check it out. So I told you we won. Uh, SmartCap was selected as the preferred technology and deployed at the site. And anytime that happens, um, and it happens kind of as much as we, we, we hope it does, uh, we very rarely go into one of these shootout situations and aren't the technology selected. Um, but we still nonetheless, rather than just getting a pat on the back, we'd like to understand what went into that so we can uh, find if there are any weaknesses, see what we can do better. Uh, one of the things that was interesting about this particular decision to select SmartCap was part of what seemed to drive this was less about SmartCap in some regards and more about concerns with the alternative. And this again goes back to the whole thing about a shootout and one of the other, I guess, complications of doing two things in parallel. Um, being a camera solution, there were clear concerns about privacy. Um, I think most of us can appreciate, and I certainly personally appreciate, um, businesses treat uh, any sort of technology video recordings with the uh, correct level of respect um, and privacy legislation drives that as well as common sense. Um, but nonetheless, and it may only be a perception, but the perception's genuinely there. And in Queensland coal, where the workforce gets the loudest voice ever, uh, where they basically get to say yes or no to a process, which really means yes or no to a technology solution, uh, the perception of privacy concerns was certainly a driving factor against the alternative. Um, and I think, and I, I, I don't suspect it's only because they've looked at our marketing material, uh, being there in person for the very first training session with a group of eight, um, this already came up as sort of saying, well, if the other one's waiting till we fall asleep, that kind of feels a little bit too late to do anything. Isn't that too late in the process? Um, and I think the quote from the individual operator was, so why are we even testing it? Um, I think that's a little bit extreme because uh, all technologies have different pros and cons, um, but certainly the fact that it was more asleep detecting technology rather than alerting them to fatigue risk played a role. Uh, one other thing which was, I guess, a little disappointing and not, not a testament to how our competitors do business uh, as, a, as a golden rule, but, but in this particular case, certainly the, the site felt that they got limited support from that particular technology vendor, uh, which was contrasted by, I think, what is always the case, our particularly sort of excellent support. Uh, we were on site on a regular basis throughout the three months. But thankfully, this wasn't all just about us being the lesser of two evils. They did de definitely highlight in their feedback um, some benefits of our solution, which was nice. Certainly, again, on this whole a bit too late versus early warning, they certainly had a preference for an early warning alerting solution, um, as we generally see, which is why we exist. SmartCap was born out of trying to, to I guess, fill that gap. One of the things and the example highlighted here was this sort of sudden change to training and our ability to, with no props, um, condense 30 minutes of training into five minutes. 
they really saw that we, across our business, we're expert at what we do um, and we're here to help. We're here to solve, help them solve a fatigue risk problem um, and a consequence of that is selling our goods and services. We're not focused on selling, we're focused on helping. Um, this ability to use off-site and on-site um, was definitely a, a big factor for this particular site. Some people drive to and from camp to the mine, but certainly some people drive home after their swing. So this can be anywhere from a two to a 10 hour drive in their own vehicle. And so the fact that their life band, uh, their smart cap life band just goes with them and they can just download the app from the app store and off they go, um, meant that they could protect themselves on the drive home to their family um, beyond just being protected at work. And that was a real, I guess, selling point, so to speak, for the workforce. Um, we were on site, we were on site regularly, uh, and they appreciated the fact that we not only were able to address the tough questions, but invited them. Um, we don't like to leave concerns and nagging questions un, un, unaddressed. And so, yeah, we, we certainly were there to do that and to help their team make this part of every day. So we don't just know how brainwaves work, we don't just know how fatigue works. We understand how our customers' businesses work because we've done this for a long time. And so by whether it's a trucking business or a mining business, we know how to make smart cap use part of every day. And so to able to help the supervisors, the, the, the dispatch team, the superintendents and so forth, make this part of every day was, I guess, appreciated. Finally, um, because, because we're providing early warning alerts that are generally, like I said, that private interaction with the operator, uh, the feedback we received was that that gave the workforce the sense that SmartCap was focused on them rather than being a technology just to give alarms to management. And so the fact that we're focused on them resonated well since in Queensland, Cole, they're the ones who are making the decisions. Uh, this all happened, like I said, within the last 12, 13 months and COVID-19, which has really hurt a lot of people and businesses around the world, and we're certainly thinking of them, um, impacted this deployment as well. So all of the decision, selection of the technology and the ballot all took place prior to COVID. And it was the live deployment, I think in early, there we go. The full deployment did happen in early March. Um, so right before, right before the world kind of went on lockdown and certainly here in Australia, went on lockdown, um, the deployment had happened. So what that had meant is we'd been on site, the entire workforce had been trained after all the gear had been deployed. So training was uninterrupted by that. But like I said, as we do, whether it's a small scale pilot or a full scale deployment, we like to in that sort of three week range after training is touch base. Cause that's when the real questions come, as I said. And so it turned out though, we'd planned engagement sessions for late March, early April, but they were postponed to July. So instead of being three to four weeks after people had trained, the first in-person engagement with us for the people who were using this technology all day, every day, was three to four months instead of that three to four weeks. So that, that really uh, hurt. It really hurt not having the ability to address the questions and concerns. And what happened was, the issues, the rumors that come up, oh, it's using brainwaves to measure your alertness and fatigue score, um, but maybe it's also sending your brainwaves uh, to the internet and all of the sort of kooky things that can pop into our heads and then just fuel the rumor mill. Um, those things we were unable to put to bed as quickly as we would like because we weren't there. And it really shone a light on our need to uh, put better systems in place, uh, better systems to manage that phase, that very immature early phase of a full deployment remotely. And so we've put heaps of work into it. And so COVID um, hasn't just transformed the world, it's transformed how we do business. And so we're much more prepared now. Um, but thankfully, we worked closely with the, the business and have been able to move past uh, any sort of issues and concerns and the teething issues that come with a full scale deployment. And one of the other things that happened with, with COVID-19 is amongst other things, downturns, impact on the coal, pro coal price. 
they've had a little bit of staff turnover and that impacted continuity specifically <clears throat> pardon me specifically because uh, it was unclear without that on-site presence who was responsible for what we haven't we hadn't gone back and done that refresher training and engagement with the support roles that we had planned and so because it was unclear what people's roles were uh, and in addition to the fact that we hadn't onboarded yet a train the trainer model uh, with new operators coming in uh, there was no one really to train them and so they were kind of learning from their colleagues uh, and you have the Chinese whispers kind of problem of misinformation just propagating so we definitely learned a lot through COVID-19 um, but thankfully with the deployment today things are going well um, in, in our opinion and in theirs um, the roles have really clearly been defined um, that dispatch simply has to just respond when something beeps uh, where they get one of those new custom text messages or emails um, they simply respond follow the process and advise whoever needs advising um, and it's then when it beeps twice or more within a particular shift for a particular operator is when the supervisor now needs to get involved whether it's a face-to-face -face conversation or more um, and then that third level of escalation is for those higher alarm rate individuals in other words if it beeps regularly on on an everyday sort of basis for weeks and weeks, um, that might be highlighting some underlying concern and that's when the health team steps in to kick off that assistance process if they deem it necessary. So thankfully now roles have been well defined, um, but because now we have what is six months of full operation under their belts, what the data has highlighted as per the small scale pilot is some higher alarm frequency individuals um, and it's now been an ongoing concern for several months for a handful of individuals um, and with our help, um, but mostly with their great work, they're now working through an assistance process. And again, um, how to develop that assistance process is a webinar that's available in our LinkedIn feed site. So really do encourage you to check it out. It's valuable whether you're doing fatigue technology deployments or whether you're just doing anything that could require people to be through some sort of psychological or physical impairment assistance. So they're working through that process and that's highlighted a couple of holes in their own processes, which they've now, have now remedied and are helping the individuals. But I think one of the success stories of this case study is we pride ourselves on setting a tone. Like I said, we, we're here to help people. We're not here to um, blame people. We're not here to say fatigue is bad and we're certainly not here to de detect sleep. That's far too late in our opinion. Um, but because we've set this tone of we're here to help, we're here to help them solve a problem and empower operators and empower the business to do so, um, they've sort of embraced that. And now rather than saying there's something wrong with you, you've done something wrong because you're fatigued and kind of carrying that tone, the business has really made a great effort to show these individuals they're here to help. They want them to be back at work with that risk identified and resolved. And so with the focus on resolving the issue, their assistance has been received far better than it could have been otherwise. So that's a great shout out to them. I think they've done a fantastic job. One of the other things, and it's not actually related to just high alarm rate individuals, although this is where it was first highlighted, <clears throat> is they're starting to notice some trends really emerge in the data that are telling them some areas for improvement. At this particular site, one of the things that was highlighted was um, their alarm rate on the first and second night shift of their particular split roster panel. Uh, their first and second night shifts were way, way the highest risk. And so what that means is um, it's indicative of people not particularly preparing for shift well, preparing for that transition from three weeks out of every four, being like most people and staying awake during the daytime and sleeping at nighttime and that everything gets switched for that one week out of every four. And so that transition's not being handled particularly well, but they do have some superstars who are handling it well. And so the plan moving forward is hopefully through identifying those superstars is let's find out what they're doing well and see if we can roll that into how we educate the workforce for preparing for night shift. Um, we're also looking to the future and that's great, looking to the future together. Um, and so as with COVID-19 happening, the coal price dropping, there's definitely a squeeze uh, in terms of the ability for people to invest and justify 
uh, investing in technology. So one of the things they're looking to do is analyze the genuine return on investment because we all have heard um, a fatigued operator is an inefficient operator. Um, and that's a great sort of throwaway line and good for a marketing brochure. But in reality, there's been some studies done that show when a person's less alert, they're less fuel efficient. Uh, for example, they're more kind to equipment, more gentle on heavy mining equipment. When they're more alert and less fatigued, they're more likely to follow procedures and so on. And so we're working together to see if we can get hard numbers, a proper measurement to see is this legit, is fatigue costly to the tune where it means when you invest in something like smart cap as a fatigue technology, you're not really spending money, you're, you're saving or making money um, because you're helping people be less fatigued. So you're de-risking the business. But then in addition to that, you're, I guess, eliminating some of those extra costs that comes with fatigue. And part of the motivation here is the business uh, has let us know that they're, they're uh, interested in expanding to the other sites they have in the coal portfolio. And, uh, and so to do that though, in these sorts of times, it's really important that the investment uh, can be justified now that we have all of this data. That's really all we wanted to cover today. I hope that was an interesting uh, case study for us to walk through. Um, and as I said, there's a whole bunch of um, really interesting uh, like information that's available in the other webinars that relates to this. Um, since we've gone a little bit over time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, post some video replies to the questions uh, that we've received online. Uh, and what I will do is I'll invite you to our next webinar. So the next webinar coming up and the date will be announced soon on LinkedIn is related to this selection process. Um, how a business goes about uh, not only picking which fatigue technology is right for it, but what we've learned is the best practice for making sure the approach you use for picking the solution that's right for you um, goes along with uh, your future success in deploying it well, if and when you, you do go ahead and pick that one. So I think that's going to be an excellent webinar. We've, we've got a document that's circulating out there written about this. This will be a webinar version of it with the latest sort of best practice we've drawn from our customers. So I look forward to you joining me then for that webinar. And until then, thanks again for your time today. And uh, we hope to be able to help your business soon. Thanks again.